Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Now we're going to take you to Texas, the Austin area, for a story about how workers are working together across some pretty interesting traditional divides. Immigrant workers, undocumented workers, non-union workers, working with union folks, taking direct action, passing legislation, getting federal investigations, getting back pay reclaimed for workers. It's quite a story. To tell us that story from Texas is Christine Tsinsun. She is the executive director of the Workers' Defense Project, and with her, Richard Shaw, secretary treasurer of the AFL-CIO, right there in Texas. Welcome to the program. Glad to have you with us. Really impressive work that you've been doing. Just in a nutshell, what have you accomplished in the last couple of years? Well, I think we've been raising standards in a really challenging place. Texas is one of the most hostile climates for workers um, and also a really anti-immigrant state. You know, the construction industry right now in Texas employs about a million workers and half are undocumented. But even against these odds, we've been achieving a lot. We've passed a statewide law against wage theft, another law that helps protect the rights of construction workers working on state projects. And, and in Texas, you don't even have basic things like rest breaks. So we've been passing legislation as well at the local level to win workers the right to paid rest breaks and taking on some of the largest corporations that are building in the state of Texas and in the country right now. And what's been remarkable about it from the union point of view, Richard? Well, from the union point of view is that the building trades have been partnering in the and involved with the worker center. And for those who may not realize why that's such a big deal? Well, it's a big deal because the, first of all, the building trades um, don't do a lot of the work. You know, the building trades kind of confine themselves to heavy commercial industrial work, and they don't do a lot of the work that that, that the other trades, you know, especially the workers that, that come to the worker center are doing. There's also been a historic sort of antipathy in some places with worker union workers saying, wait a minute, immigrants are taking our jobs. Well, that, that's always been there. And, and but from my, my from my standpoint, I don't really see that. Uh, the, 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 there's a lot of construction in Texas, and if the building trades has not organized that construction, it, it may be the kind of work they do, but it's not. It was not their work, but their their wages they felt were being undercut yeah. by the workers doing that work because those workers were sometimes, oftentimes, receiving less, sometimes receiving nothing, and and working under horrendous conditions. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about those conditions a little bit, Christina. The workers that the Workers' Defense Project works with, what is their life like at work? Well, you know, in other parts of the country, construction jobs are good blue-collar jobs. Um, but in Texas, that isn't the case. So in Texas, even though most of the workers work full-time, nearly half live in poverty, one in five experience wage theft, and Texas is the most deadly place for construction workers in the country. At its peak just a couple of years ago, there was a worker dying every two and a half days in, in Texas. So no state comes even close to seeing the number of workers injured and killed on the job as Texas does. And, you know, just to speak to what Richard was saying, you know, I do think that the building trades in Texas have come a long way. Um, and we are working together. That wasn't a relationship that was always steady. It was a little rocky in the beginning, um, but we worked really hard because we knew we had a lot more in common um, as a work, as a people representing the working class than being divided. That was what business wanted us to be. Talk about this federal probe a little bit, the OSHA investigation. Um, how did that come about? Well, in 2009, um, there were a series of accidents that were just some really atrocious accidents. Um, and we also were releasing a report that same month where these accidents happened that showed that Texas was the most deadly place for construction workers. There was a project where three workers plummeted 13 stories. Um, none of them were being paid correctly or overtime. Um, and it was found that the company was negligent. And so we went to OSHA and asked them if they could do something in Texas and they launched a federal investigation and were able to increase uh, fines across the state and since then have put more investigators on the ground in Texas. And for the first time, we've started to see a dip in the number of workplace fatalities in Texas. But we still have a long way to go to ensure that Texas is safe for workers. And you've also, you mentioned claimed back wages for workers in the tens of thousands. Well, we've recovered about a million dollars for construction workers in Texas, um, but it's, that's just one small piece of how much workers are actually owed. And one in five workers in the construction industry in Texas aren't paid for their work. It's an 
incredibly common practice, and we see it more in the construction industry than in any other industry in Texas. There's a lot of waste theft out there, so what we recover is just a small amount. Yeah. In Houston, it's maybe been five or six hundred thousand dollars over the last three or four years, but that turns out to be, you know, maybe fifteen percent. And what have you learned in terms of strategy about how to try to go off to some of those um, employers who are stealing wages? It's not always 100% clear who the employer is in some of these circumstances. Isn't that right, Richard? Well, one, you have to find out who they are, and a lot of times they're subs. And uh, so what, what we, what, you, you have several recourses. You, you can go into a small claims court or a justice of the peace court. You can apply through the Texas Workforce Commission. And, and, and make application and then and then an investigation is done. Or you could file criminal charges. Uh, nobody in Houston files any criminal charges because the, you know the DA's office is not taking waste theft cases. So, so you have to you have to pursue it. Then you try to get a judgment if you pursue it. And then even if you get a judgment, they still don't pay. And I know in, in I don't know about Austin, but in, in Houston we have they, they, they have something called a justice bus where they load that bus up with people and they go and visit the employer mm. at, at, the, at the work site. And the employer doesn't like it. Oftentimes it's somebody living in a house and they'll pass things out to the neighbors and tell the neighbors who's living there and what they're doing, to, you know, and, and they try to then, that's called the public embarrassment model. Yeah. But, but sometimes that actually results in, in getting the money. But um, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, we're, we're working on a wage theft ordinance in Houston that would tie wage theft to anything, any kind of a city permit that the city has to give or grant so that if, if, if you want to do business with the city, you can't have, you know, for lack of a better term, a lien against you. Well, I was going to ask, are there models coming out of the work that you're doing that would be applicable in other parts of the country? Christina? Well, I think what's happening in our economy is that, you know, one in three are now contingent workers or temporary workers. And that's what happens in the construction industry. There's a huge subcontracting chain. So who the employer is is really confusing and challenging. But at the end of the day, everyone's benefiting from workers being paid so poorly or not being paid. So we go after the developer and project owner because they're at the end of the day who can hold the entire subcontracting chain responsible. So some of the work that we've been doing in groups like the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, it's really creative in looking at consumers and end users as a way to leverage and put pressure to get workers' wages back, and that's how we do it in, in Workers' Defense Project. Is we do go after individual employers, but we let everyone know on that project that they can't turn a blind eye to what's happening to one subcontractor and say, I paid that guy downriver, it's not my problem. It's everyone's problem. Yeah. I was really impressed to hear you'd managed to wrestle the big Apple to the table. Mm -hmm. um, talk about that campaign, that the Apple Corporation was going to have a really beautiful tax package, tax break package from the city of Austin to build their office, next office building, I think, there? It's a mega complex they were trying to build in Austin, and they were going to get about $30 million between the city, county, and state to come to Texas and build. You know, this is a corporation, one of the largest in the world, and they were getting millions of dollars of our, of our, of our tax money in And Texas. they were getting that, as I understand it, because they were promising they were going to be bringing good jobs. They were promising they were going to be bringing good jobs. We were talking about high-tech jobs. There was no discussion about the janitorial workers or the construction workers, some of the lowest paid workers in our state. And for the first time, we brought that conversation to the city and to the state and were able to win construction workers a living wage floor, safety training, and then some other higher standards. But the biggest part is that we get to monitor those standards and Apple is now accountable to Workers Defense Project and our membership. Um, and that's in their contract with the city. And how the heck did you pull that off, and who's the we in this picture? Well, the we is a, it's a huge coalition. That's how we get things done in a, in a really difficult climate, is we have construction workers that are union and non-union working with us, the faith community, and also creative policymakers at the local level that are willing to stick their neck out and do what's right, um, is how we were able to get that done. Well, and you've also got business partners. That's right. You know, and, 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 and our business partners, in the construction industry are primarily concerned with misclassification. Mm -hmm. The workers are classified as independent contracts, so therefore no, no FICA food is taken out, no workers' comp. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to compete, you know, the legitimate construction business people are trying to compete against that. So it's a very interesting and broad coalition. Yeah, we have, some very, we have some very conservative business owners that work with us because they just can't com compete and are now even supporting immigration reform. And, you know, it's, it's a very 
broad coalition of uh -huh. folks we work with in Texas because we have to out of necessity. And in terms of your tactics, I've seen everything from your normal protests to letter writing campaigns to, was it a, a, a thirst out or a thirst in? A thirst strike. We went to city council and in Texas it's 100 degrees and we didn't drink all day and sat out at city council and said we're not going to drink until city council passes an ordinance. These are workers that took off time at work um, and put their health at risk because they knew that every day they had to go out and work in 100 degree heat and they were willing to do that for the rest of the workforce. And so we're excited to do that now in Dallas and Houston. We're going to be launching similar campaigns. Um, and these are very conservative areas that haven't seen these kinds of tactics. And I really do actually think that people are very much in support of just these basic standards. We know that we're not actually asking for that much. We would love to ask for more, but this is where we're starting because these are the standards that we have in Texas. So does this mean creative direct action tactics are back yeah. in the labor movement, Richard? Well, I, I think it's back. And I was going to say on this, there's a trick of getting these elected officials involved with this. Because their first reaction is, it's, this isn't in my bailiwick. You know, why, why is this my problem? Why is it a problem? And, and what can I do about it? Well, you know, if you're sitting on city council, you can certainly pass ordinances that affect city jobs. That's something you can do about it. So you have to turn you have to turn an elected official into somebody who's going to engage in some kind of direct action, as you called it, and, in, and, and have the courage to intervene. And of course, fight, fight the, the, the parts of the community that do not want this intervention. And finally, two last questions. One is, how do you keep yourself going financially? I understand you have a membership structure. How does that work? And then, what difference does the AFL make, and particularly with this new emphasis here at the AFL-CIO convention on these kinds of community labor allies. So the real challenge that workers' centers face is self-sufficiency. Um, and how are we going to be able to sustain right. our gains? Because we win a campaign and all we've done is create more work for ourselves. Right. But I think the partnership with the AFL-CIO is really important. And it's, I think, important to the workers we represent, but more than anything to the labor unions that are here. You know, they've taken a stand on immigration reform and have helped push that dialogue nationally and have actually made their union stronger because of that. And I'm hopeful that this is going to be a step forward in that direction as well now to be able to make unions stronger and our voice of the working class in this country a lot stronger. And is there anything that the union movement can do to make its relationship with the workers' centers more, as they say, transformational and less transactional as far as you're concerned? Well, I think that that's going to happen to have to happen at the grassroots. You know, the work we've done in Texas hasn't been easy to develop relationships with the building trades, but they are real relationships that are going to last. When legislators have tried to divide us, they haven't been able to do that. And that's only going to be able to happen through long-term organizing where people can develop relationships. Thank you both. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Great to have you. Thank you.